I realize uh, I'm coming uh, to this debate uh, uh, after, long after the debate actually took place, uh, but I wanted to add some comments that I haven't seen from any other commentators about this particular debate involving uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson. Uh, I've put a, a um, hyperlink in the comments to the uh, video of the debate. Uh, the debate took place on November 19th, uh, 2016, so it's been quite out there quite, quite a long time. There were three debaters uh, uh, on, in the video. Uh, there's Dr. Jordan Peterson, who's now the, the most famous uh, psychologist in the world, I guess. Uh, the other debaters was a, were a uh, Dr. Mary, Mary Bryson, who appeared to be principally a transgender activist. At least that's what she was, um, uh, the appearance that she gave and, uh, throughout the debate. The third person was a Dr. Linda Kosman, and I may not have that last name right. I wasn't sure that I uh, captured it exactly, uh, but she was a lawyer uh, who apparently also teaches at the uh, law school at the University of Toronto. Uh, and she was there primarily to offer an explanation of the law uh, that was uh, the subject of the debate. It was about uh, some recent uh, changes, uh, legal changes in Canadian law dealing with uh, transgenderism. Uh, and the issue really was a result of how, uh, why Dr. Peterson is so, uh, so well known today. Uh, now, neither of those particular topics, the particular legal issues and the transgenderism in general, uh, those really weren't of much interest to me. But the debate um, was of interest to me because the debate pitched the two main sides in a perennial debate which has uh, been going on for centuries. And that's a debate between uh, the two sides are generally identified as the naturalists on one side and positivists on the other. Uh, this is an intellectual conflict that's been raging mainly since the 18th century, but has roots which go back millennia. Uh, it involves mainly important subjects from uh, such topics as the family, to law, to the social sciences, and many, many other areas. So it cuts across a lot of human knowledge here. Uh, Peterson represented the naturalist side of the, of the conflict, and the other two debaters uh, defended the positivist side. Uh, actually, I thought that the debate was uh, much more interest, as I say, from this angle than was the narrow topic of genderism and the particular Canadian law issues involved. Uh, so I won't have much to say about those more narrow issues uh, other than in passing. All the debaters used terminology that I found somewhat problematic. There was one term in particular that I objected to, and it was the phrase social construct or social constructionism. Uh, later, I'll explore why the use of that term, um, I think, inadvertently was uh, indirectly bolstering Peterson's arguments and significantly damaged the arguments of Bryson and Kosman, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail later. Um, uh, I was also mystified by the fact that there was one term that was entirely missing from the debate that should have been central to it, and that's the word convention or conventional or conventionalism, depending on the context. Uh, I'll come back to that in uh, much more detail later. The uh, conflict between the naturalists and the positivists revolves around whether human society's various social entities, such as the family, language, law, all these, these other, I'll just refer to them generally as social entities, whether they are natural or they are merely conventional. I hope to convince you to reject the two extremes, that there's never anything which is entirely natural and there's never anything which is entirely conventional. Uh, rather, I, I believe that social entities are all in part natural and in part conventional, 
and I'll, as I say, I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Actually, um, it's pretty rare to find a naturalist who claims that social entities are entirely nat natural. On the other hand, a large majority, appears to me, of, of positivists appear to claim that all social entities are entirely conventional. Uh, the, the debaters opposing Peterson both explicitly said that such entities are entirely conventional. So I take them to be out at the far end of the positivist spectrum. Uh, I'm going to try to show why these debaters uh, supported the extremist version of positivism um, and that the so-called social constructs, uh, what, what they mean by saying social constructs, constructs, are that um, all these entities are entirely conventional. Peterson was the only debater who actually explicitly mentioned positivism. I thought that was an interesting um, observation. Uh, the debate failed to develop the way that typical debates do between naturalists and positives, uh, how they play out in practice. And while none of the debaters were able to bridge the gap between the extremes of naturalism and positivism. For background, let me explain a little philosophical history that may be useful with a little help from Aristotle. Uh, Aristotle said that many species of animals are social animals. For example, uh, even bees and ants. You know, the beehive and the ant mound both demonstrate that bees and ants are both social animals. Uh, but note that such animals build their hives, they build their, the ant mound the same way everywhere and over countless generations, sometimes for millions of years. Uh, everything other animals do in this regard as compared to humans, of course, when they do that, such as the bees and, and ants, they do by uh, instinct and habituation only. Uh, similar to other animals, Humans are also a social animal. In other words, humans are by nature social animals. Uh, I think that is indisputable. For example, all that we have to do is to look at the evolutionary evidence of that social nature because, for just one example, uh, take the, um, the, the issue of human young who are entirely dependent on others for their care, feeding, and, and so on for years. Uh, and is actually that social nature is what preserves uh, the continuity um, of human beings. Uh, but Aristotle makes an additional point here that seems to be lost on the modern positivists, um, is that, um, uh, that that's not all that humans are. They are also rational animals capable of making free choices and are thus, uh, we might also say they on the one hand they are social, but they are also, also political animals in the ability that they have the, the um, ability to uh, exercise uh, free will and to make uh, informed choices. So humans don't abandon their social nature just because they are also a rational and thus political animal. Uh, and herein lies Aristotle's truth uh, that all that humans do require that we acknowledge both our social nature and our political and rational nature in all that we do all the time. The logical implication that Aristotle draws is that all of our society's institutions are always built on a natural foundation that incorporates our species-specific nature, even though the rational decisions we make in the process are largely conventional. Um, I say largely, not exclusively, as do the, did the positivists in this debate. Uh, a subsidiary area, error uh, made by the extreme positivists like uh, Kosman and Bryson uh, is that nature and convention uh, the, the, the error that the positivists make are that the nature, uh, natural aspect and the conventional side are mutually exclusive. That's entirely dogmatic on their part. I've never heard a convincing argument um, 
why that one excludes the other. Aristotle and most of the major philosophies for the last 24 centuries have uh, rejected that, that particular notion. Uh, one aside here, uh, my view is that extreme positivism is almost always incoherent, mainly because positivists carelessly insert natural justifications for their views uh, whenever they think it helps their argument. Um, there is one example of this during the debate when Dr. Bryson claims that her arguments are based in ethics. Uh, positivists almost always confirm that ethical claims are entirely dogmatic and are really just subjective preferences. So don't expect logical consistency from, from the positivists. Uh, early in the debate, Peterson asserted that he thought the claim regarding social construction was wrong. Um, at this point, I wasn't clear on what Peterson's meaning was. Uh, what that is, uh, if he meant that such claims are entirely conventional, uh, then I agree with Peterson completely. On the other hand, if Peterson was saying that such claims uh, are entirely natural, then I would disagree with Peterson. Um, I would have, it would have been better, I think, had Peterson stressed that he views social entities as always partly natural and partly conventional. Uh, he could have further clarified his position by saying that with respect to the dual nature of social entities, that the two aspects may be analytically distinct, but that they are existentially inseparable. In other words, people may analyze these uh, natural aspects or the, the conventional aspect of social entities, but that they cannot be separated in reality. Uh, this would have substantially strengthened Peterson's argument, I think. Uh, I want to try to explain why so many social science academics and other intellectuals make this positivist error. Uh, I'm sure that there are many reasons why it happens, and so I don't say that this is the exclusive uh, uh, reason or root problem, but let's focus on it in only one area and, and see if that at least partially explains it. I think it involves a failure by many to recognize the essential distinction between the natural sciences and the social sciences in their objects. And let me explain. The object of the uh, investigative natural sciences is the natural thing in change. In other words, investigation of a particular kind of thing and a particular kind of change. For example, physics deals with the causes of change. Now let's compare the object of, a, of an investigative social science as a social thing. As I said before, every social thing is only partially natural while also being partially conventional or a product of voluntary human action. Society is natural because humans are by nature a social animal, but any particular society is constituted by humans as a rational and voluntary determination of humanity's social powers. Uh, as natural, Social entities are studied in psychology, since the natural principle of social entities is human nature as, as social. As conventional, social entities are always particulars, and therefore knowledge of them is necessarily historical and not scientific knowledge. Uh, you'll hear Dr. Bryson conflate the social sciences and the natural sciences during the debate with no apparent awareness of the intellectual error that she was making. Uh, from that, it follows that social entities can't be objects of science in the strict sense, but must be objects of a mixture of psychology and history. Positivism uh, committed an error in supposing that the study of social entities could be investigative science in the same sense that the study of particular kinds of natural things is science. In other words, the distinction between the natural sciences and the so-called social sciences 
is a radical difference in kind rather than merely a difference in degree. All of the foregoing observations I've made so far uh, seem to have been almost entirely lost on modern social sciences, scientists and uh, other intellectuals. My suspicion is that these scientists are entirely unfamiliar with the millennia of writing on these matters because uh, most of them don't seem to have, um, uh, uh, most of the past seems to be of no interest to so many uh, academics, unfortunately. During the debate, um, Peterson seemed to be largely in accordance with my observations, but the other two debaters uh, evinced no awareness of any of these matters at all. Uh, let me also make the obvious point that the utility of the social sciences in the practical, practical order is on the level as regards the solution of practical problems, including ethical ones. Uh, they have their utility primarily, if not exclusively, in the solution of political problems. And I would include legal problems as a subordinate type of political problem. That's why I thought it was so important to sort this out in my own mind when trying to deal with the Canadian problem regarding the transgender-related legal issues. Uh, this is why I think that Peterson's involvement in the transgender issue is so valuable. The psychologist's role is especially useful in, re in resolving so those kinds of issues, though the Canadian Senate evidenced no awareness of Peterson's unique value when um, a committee of the Senate was uh, uh, had a hearing in which uh, Peterson testified. At this point, it might be helpful to switch the focus to some of the assertions made by Dr. Kosman, the lawyer, regarding topics that are entirely conventional in her view, or as she said, social constructs. And uh, there are three areas that she mentioned as being entirely conventional, and she used the term, um, uh, the adverb, entirely. Uh, uh, in the areas of language and in law and the family. Uh, so let me briefly... Uh, go into why uh, I think that uh, Kosovo and the lawyer was so wrong with respect to these, uh, these areas. Uh, let's start with language. Let me start with a little explanation of how my interest in this area came about. Uh, all of us recall the novel Tarzan okay, um, by Edgar Rice Burroughs. And we've all seen a Tarzan movie, probably more than one. Uh, as the story goes, Tarzan's family is flying over Air Africa when there are um, plane problems that leads to the, the plane crashing. Tarzan's the only survivor. Now, typically, when we first see Tarzan, he's an infant without the ability to understand language, um, and he's surrounded by the apes. He's, well, he's supposed to have been raised by the apes. And then the movie skips forward in time, say, to uh, 20 years, and now Tarzan has uh, miraculously the ability to speak, albeit using only maybe some uh, uh, limited uh, human language skills. This storyline always resulted in cognitive dissonance for me because of the failure to explain how Tarzan acquired his language skills and also how it happened to occur in, as, as appeared uh, in the absence of other humans, in other words, in the absence of society and the accompanying social interaction. Uh, in the, back in the early 1970s, I uh, uh, listened to a presentation by the eminent mathematician Jacob Bronofsky. Uh, if you haven't heard of him before, he was one of that group of scientists and mathematicians uh, uh, and other uh, STEM uh, experts who helped win World War II. During the lecture, Bronofsky made a striking statement that has always stuck with me. He said that if a human being didn't learn language by about, I think it was, uh, as I recall, age 12, that that person will never be able to use language. You've missed your chance at that point. Didn't matter what language was learned, 
what conventional language was learned, only that that person acquired language skills while young. Now, this fact to me seems enough by itself to conclude that language requires a human's social nature as a prerequisite to learning any particular conventional language. If language is entirely conventional, as Dr. Kostman said, how does the positive explain this natural limit on the ability to acquire language skills? If language is entirely conventional, then how do you explain that fact uh, that we can permanently deprive a person of language skills by merely cutting off a person's access to society? Uh, but this isn't the only evidence of the importance of nature with respect to language that rebuts um, Dr. Kostman's uh, claim that language is entirely conventional. For example, human beings are the only animal in nature with the power of syntactical speech. Uh, no other animal exhibits that power in the slightest degree, suggesting that there is a fundamental discontinuity in nature between humanity's nature and the nature of all other animals. Um, this special, unique human ability allows only humans uh, to talk with respect to things about the past, the present, and the future. One final example of how um, human nature gives us special powers unique among other animals. Humans are the only animal which has the ability to discuss topics which are unavailable to any of our five senses. Consider these examples of objects of thought. Justice, time, God, fairness, metaphysics, and many other. None of these ideas can be seen, smelled, touched, or heard, or accessed by any of our five senses. So how does the positive, positivist explain our ability to speak, write about, and discuss such topics um, unless there is something in human's nature that makes it possible that is entirely lacking in all other animals. Let's move on to the, uh, um, the idea of law, another one that Dr. Kostman claimed is uh, entirely conventional. This is an area about which I have some special knowledge, uh, having been a student of legal philosophy for many decades. Uh, let me uh, explain in a little more detail the positivist view of law. Few areas of human concern more clearly demonstrate that social entities are naturally founded while being conventional in the particularities of the particulars uh, than does law. Uh, like other social entities, the natural aspects and conventional aspects of law can be analytically distinct while still being existentially inseparable. Positivists give law precedence, precedence uh, and primacy over justice rather than the other way around. You know, they get it exactly backwards. In other words, they deny that law is in any way natural instead of regarding natural justice as the foundation from which man-made law springs, uh, the source of its authority, and the measure of its legitimacy. In other words, the positivist turns things upside down. It regards positive law, the man-made law of the state, as the sole source of justice, the only determination of what is right or wrong for individuals to do in relation to one another and to the community itself, then, is whatever the, the positive law itself says. The positivist view um, it ripples through philosophy and morals in unexpected ways. For, for example, let me identify just a few of them. Um, one thing it does, it neglects or rejects the distinction in philosophy between real and apparent goods. And I wish I had more time to explain that, but that is a very, very significant fact that has profound impact um, in the area of um, ethics. Uh, similarly, it does the same thing with natural needs and acquired wants. All human beings have both natural needs, 
and they also have acquired wants. The positivists can't find any basis, there's no basis at all for the distinction between what ought to be desired or done and with respect to what is desired or done. That distinction is completely lost on them. Although, as we saw with Dr. Bryson, Bryson um, uh, she was claiming that there can be oughts, but, with, but in the process she's also rejecting her own conventionalism. Uh, according to the positivists, there are no natural rights, no natural justice, ending up with the conclusion that man-made law alone determines what is just or unjust or what is right and wrong. There are other uh, distinctions that have uh, been made in the law, in the law for, for millennia, which the positivist view just totally obliterates. Let me just list a few of them. Uh, I'd like to point out that not every positivist, like I said earlier on, not every positivist will agree with every item on this list, but all of the items are logical, necessary conclusions from the extreme positivist view. First, um, they can't get away from the conclusion that might makes right. Anybody who remembers uh, uh, the historical figure in Plato of Thrasymachus, he was the one who said that, that when it comes to the law, might makes right. Um, so they're throwing their lot in. The positivists are in perfect agreement with Thrasymachus on that. Uh, there can be no such thing as a, uh, the tyranny of majority, of the majority. Here, they have no way to say that there are any way, uh, is any way to make a distinction between the rights of a minority versus the majority. Uh, only the naturalist can, can make such a distinction. Um, there, there are no criteria for judging laws or constitutions as unjust and in need of amendment. Uh, positivists disagree with the naturalist conclusion that an unjust law is a law in name only. Uh, uh, Another one uh, I might mention uh, is that the, the positivist view makes it impossible for a positivist to say that, let's, for example, uh, that the, um, the current U.S. Constitution is better or worse than the 18th, view, 18th century view of the uh, U.S. Constitution. Yet they have no basis at all for making such a distinction other than as a result of, of uh, preferences and not on any uh, principle basis such as in ethics. Um, so for the positivists, let me explain here that Thomas Aquinas had an interesting uh, uh, quote in, in his treatise on law in the 13th century. He said that, Law binds the good man in conscience and the bad man by fear. For the positivists, the only motivator in the law is fear. They would not agree that it binds someone in conscience because that would imply that there are some ethical obligations to obey the law. Uh, so for the positivists, positive laws have force only and no authority. So it's only through the fear of punishment uh, uh, that people go along with the law. It also obliterates, and this is a little bit of a technical distinction here, mainly for any lawyers listening to this. Uh, the positivist view, the legal positivists at least, they obliterate the distinction between laws which are, no, are identified as mala prohibita, a little Latin here, and laws which are mala in se. For hundreds of years, naturalists have maintained that there is a distinction between laws which reflect underlying acts which are bad in and of themselves, for example, laws against murder. Uh, and we make a distinction with laws which are merely convenient uh, for convenience and the sake of order, such as traffic laws governing which side of the road uh, that we drive on. The positivist sees no distinction in this respect between murder laws and traffic laws. 
I want to stress that the um, divide between the naturalists and the positivists don't line up in accordance with the views of the political left and the political right. Uh, to prove that, I'd like to read from the, uh, some of the writings of the late George, uh, Judge uh, Robert Bork. Uh, Bork was a thoroughgoing positivist, uh, despite uh, being a very uh, political, politically conservative judge. Uh, I do think that in general, conservatives, tre conservatives trend towards naturalism, while progressives uh, trend toward positivism. But the at least in, in the law and in many other areas today, uh, positivism is overwhelmingly the uh, prevailing worldview. Uh, so thus, uh, when Bork was being considered for a seat on the U.S. Supreme Court, he was supported by conservatives who liked the results he reached, uh, and he was opposed uniformly by all of the progressives for the same reason. Yet, there were far more progressives who agreed with Bork's positivism than on the conservative side. Uh, here's what Bork wrote many years ago. He said, no system of morals or ethical values has any objective or intrinsic value, validity of its own. If a right is not specifically listed in the Constitution, then it is just a preference or a gratification. Now, I think anybody would agree with everything I've said about legal positivism so far is in perfect accord with, with Bork's view. Uh, furthermore, uh, according to Bork, uh, courts must accept any value choice the legislature makes unless it clearly runs contrary to the choice made in the framing of the Constitution. In other words, had Bork been a judge prior to the abol abolition of slavery, Bork might have felt duty-bound to enforce slavery laws and, and thought he was doing the right thing. Uh, he also said, uh, every clash between a minority claiming freedom from regulation and the majority asserting its freedom to regulate requires a choice between gratifications. In other words here, uh, Bork is saying that the preferences and gratifications of the majority must always prevail. Bork would not be ready to rule against a majority, uh, or against a majority, uh, if there were minority rights being violated. Um, positivists of the right and the left medical, uh, political persuasion have no rejoinder to Bork's poisonous views and no way to rebut uh, his views in any principled matter, uh, manner. Um, uh, if you want to compare naturalism in the law with legal positivism, I give you a sort of, in a lot of ways, sort of the leading, uh, the best views out there. One is uh, to read uh, Thomas Aquinas's treatise on law, uh, written in the 13th century, uh, contained in the Summa Theologica, and. You, uh, on the other side, for the positivist view, you could read H.L.A. Hart's The Concept of Law, um, where uh, Hart uh, uh, feels that, since he is a thoroughgoing positivist when he wrote the book, uh, that um, he, he, the whole book is written as a descriptive project and explicitly says that in order to completely explain law, we do not need any naturalism to explain it. Now, that may not be perfectly clear, but you'll just have to tr trust me on that, that that is what uh, um, Hart is saying in his famous book. And uh, that book, that particular book, The Concept of Law, is uh, the Bible for uh, legal positivists today. Uh, although even Hart himself, toward the end, added a little postscript to the, to the book that uh, seemed to weaken somewhat his um, objection to uh, saying that there is a natural foundation in law. So not, it was a little bit ambiguous, but it seemed as though Hart was softening his position somewhat uh, shortly before his death. Uh, the last thing I want to say about 
law is a, a comment on the lawyer debater's claim that human rights are all about respect and dignity. And th this is Dr. Kosman, the lawyer. Uh, I think that's ridiculous. The purpose of man-made positive laws dealing with civil rights is to enforce the natural rights of every human. Uh, think about it this way. Uh, a constitution is the rule or measure of the justice of man-made laws. But a constitution is in turn measured by natural justice. Thus, civil rights laws are founded in human natural rights, though they vary conventionally in their particulars. This again is the Aristotelian idea of man as a social animal and as a rational animal. Uh, this point was entirely missed by the lawyer, probably because her positivism rejects the very notion of natural rights and natural justice. So all she had left was dignity and respect, which sounded to me more like matters of conventional manners than uh, fundamental principles. Positivism prevents one from even making judgments about whether a constitution is more or less uh, just uh, when compared over time, as I've already explained. Um, okay, enough about law. Let's look at the family. Uh, as I've said before, the family, like other social entities, is naturally founded despite the fact that the particulars of any, any individual family can vary conventionally. This is why the naturalists have, throughout human recorded history, uh, they discuss the implications of the structure of the family. Uh, this fact was entirely lost during the dis discussion over the question of, of, for example, in the United States, uh, over the discussion of uh, gay marriage. Um, and again, I won't go into that, but I think you can sort of get an idea of why I might feel that way. Uh, during most of history, there was a great... Uh, I tell you what, let me give you a little little background on this uh, is uh, th there was at least up until um, fairly recently in the last 30 years or so there was a great deal of discussion about the family as the natural f foundation uh, and th th that there's a natural foundation for the family in every known time and place in human history um, during the, that recent uh, discussion of gay marriage here in the United States all of the discussion, the scholarly articles, and popular opinions were focused almost exclusively on individuals and individual rights. In other words, the discussion of the implications of the family structure was largely ignored, uh, even though there's uh, uh, tw at least 24 centuries of, of writings that fill entire libraries about the, the structure of, of the family as the foundation of every society. Um, at the time, uh, to me, this looked like uh, the U.S. was ignoring the very foundation of its own society. Uh, it was like building the foundation of a house and ignoring the nature of the materials, uh, the shape and the size of the building blocks for that foundation. Uh, let me be clear here, I'm not, I'm not criticizing the result that the U.S. reached, only that the public discussion entirely ignored critical aspects dealing with the foundational questions by ignoring the family and focusing only on the individual. Another way to, to look at it is that the discussion focused on the individuals to the exclusion um, of the foundational uh, makeup of the society, uh, and it failed to take advantage of all that wisdom that was out there. and. The uh, debaters, Kosman and Bryson, um, here they are claiming that the family is an entirely conventional social entity um, uh, as they were debating Peterson. They both fell into that particular category. Uh, this seems so strange to me, given that the family has been the foundation of every society, everywhere, always. Uh, in the face of that, how do the positivists claim that the family is entirely conventional and offer no proof whatsoever? And I'm not familiar with any uh, convincing argument by anybody ever uh, to, to the effect that the, the family is entirely conventional. Let's recall 
that Aristotle says that every social entity has two indispensable features. First, a natural foundation and a largely conventional configuration as to the details. Um, in support, uh, Aristotle reminds us that humans are a social animal and that we're a rational animal. Uh, neither aspect of our nature can be dispensed with or ignored. Sometimes I feel like the positivists view the natural part of our nature like a snake shedding its old skin. Uh, uh, Let's take a brief look at how Aristotle defined the core of the family uh, incorrectly, I think, or it may have been right in his time, but not today. Let me read it exactly as Aristotle wrote it. The first and smallest parts of a family are the master and slave, the husband and wife, the father and child. Now, almost no modern society would agree with that definition of the conventional aspect of a family. But note that the family unit still remains the foundational aspect everywhere, regardless of its particular configuration. Um, let me quote one other quote to you that I always uh, recall when thinking about the family. According to Rousseau, he said, the family is the most ancient of all societies and the only one that is natural. Now, I agree with the first half of that sentence. I disagree that it's the only natural aspect because uh, it rejects the wisdom that Aristotle says that our social nature is inescapable. Um, I'd also like to clarify one aspect of the nature of social entities, and it's this. Uh, I may have mentioned this before. When we say that, that the word natural applies to a community or an association of humans, we don't mean that they instinctively associate with one another as do bees and ants. I think I've already made this up, but let me just say it again. Uh, that aspect is voluntary and to the extent it's conventional is also necessary for human welfare. Positivists ignore this aspect of that natural and voluntary association. I think most of us would agree that the family... Um, uh, persists throughout human history as a result of evolution and that uh, the resulting fact that, uh, as we've said, human babies uh, remain entirely dependent for survival on others for years before they're entirely independent. In my mind, that fact is enough to convince me that the family cannot be entirely conventional. And thus, um, Dr. Kostman's uh, assertion to the contrary, I think, uh, is easily refuted. Um, only a few writers, really, until very recently, have denied the naturalness of the family, at least so far as its naturalness uh, would mean a purely instinctive formation. Uh, furthermore, uh, it's seldom been disputed that the family fulfills a natural human need, as in the case of children. Uh, it's conventional in structure. The family remains natural as a means indispensable to an end, uh, which all human beings naturally desire. As Aristotle put it, uh, uh, there must be a union of those who cannot exist without each other, namely of male and female, that the race may continue. This union formed because, in common with other animals, mankind has a natural desire to leave behind them an image of themselves. Uh, that's probably enough to make my point, though insufficient for most positivists uh, in my own experience. Uh, next, I want to talk. Uh, turn to the topic of Dr. Prison's uh, comment. I may I, I should have mentioned it at the beginning, but uh, uh, in the comments, I put uh, some um, sort of a, 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 a the various points in the uh, the time. Uh, at which certain comments are made uh, during the debate, you know, the, the number of minutes and seconds to help you find exactly what I'm talking about as I talk about some of these, these things here. Uh, I want to turn to the topic uh, that um, Dr. Bryson's comment that gender, genderism, transgenderism is a spectrum or, uh, or in any particular transgender person can lie... Um, uh, along some spectrum or continuum. Uh, 
At first, I wasn't sure what to make of this statement. Uh, something was telling me that it was incoherent as explained. And then I recalled a passage from Darwin's uh, Origin of Species, because I, I want to be as precise as I can. I want to quote the passage exactly as Darwin wrote it. Uh, here it is. Uh, said, he said, On the theory of natural selection, the extension of old forms and the production of new are intimately connected. The only distinction between species and well-marked varieties is that the latter are known or believed to be connected at the present day with intermediate gradations. What Darwin is saying here is that whereas species were formally thus connected and their connections are the missing links, then, as he says, what numberless intermediate varieties linking closely together all the species of the same group must assuredly have existed. Uh, the number of intermediate and transitional links between all living and extant species must have been inconceivably great. Yet if this theory is true, they must have all existed at the same time on Earth, linking together all the species in each group by gradations as fine as our existing varieties. I think what Darwin is saying here is that if all of these intermediate varieties were to coexist at the same time uh, today with all the species that are now on Earth, the groups we now call species would cease to be species, for all you would have would be a continuous connection of one with another. Uh, in other words, the very idea of species would no longer be necessary. All of the gradations uh, would be mere differences in degree, uh, and thus uh, a fly is an elephant is a human. And all of these purported different species would be merely grad gradations along one continuum. And so Dr. Bryson's terminology was that there is a spectrum or a continuum, a continuum along which all transgender persons reside. If I understand Dr. Bryson's argument, uh, gen she also said that gender is dynamic and is not evidenced by any bodily changes when these dynamic changes occur. Uh, that's why I concluded that such changes are, are entirely subjective and, and mental. Uh, so let me ask a question. How much more applicable is Darwin's view when the only gradations involved for transgenders are entirely subjective and mental. Uh, how does that in any way justify the idea that we need a limitless list of personal pronouns? Uh, this is why I see the Canadian law change and Dr. Bryson's claims as being impractical and incoherent, because just like as Darwin says, there can all, if we have a spectrum, then there can all, no matter how many so-called species we have along that continuum, there is always room for a limitless number of intermediates. Uh, Peterson pointed out during the debate there are already dozens of such uh, personal pronouns and still growing. Uh, since there can always be more intermediates, as Darwin said with regard to species, uh, regardless of how many sets of pronouns there are, we could end up with thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of intermediates and never reach the end. Uh, I guess the only practical limit is if every person on the planet has their own personal pronoun. Uh, so, And that's why I think the whole idea is incoherent. Um, so uh, that's where I'll, I'll leave this with just one comment. At this point is where Dr. Peterson says that the postmodernists want to destroy the Enlightenment and reduce all to chaos. And about that, sometimes it's, um, it's hard to disagree with that idea. I hope this has been helpful.